I wanted to do the desert permaculture because I, I planned on moving to Arizona. Live at a property for one year before you start making major changes. And I'm glad I did. Hello and welcome to the Permaculture Vine podcast. My name is Cormac Harkin and I'm delighted to welcome Daniel Wilson to join us today. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks for having me, Cormac. Good. Uh, I'm looking forward to the chat. So, Daniel, do you want to just give a brief 30 to 60 second introduction, please? Just um, and let me get into the details then afterwards. Sure. Uh, I got into permaculture in 2020, sort of during the corona thing. And that led me to Food Forest Abundance. I, I, I heard a podcast with a guy named Jim Gale. I'm sure you've heard of him. I got interested, but we kind of delayed our membership into the co-op. And just I spent that time before a member just watching videos online on YouTube, watching permaculture videos, listening to different podcasts. Eventually, we joined and then I got a notification that Jeff Lawton was doing his PDC in Jordan at the Greening the Desert Project in the Dead Sea Valley. So I signed up right away. I signed up right away. I thought that was not all. I wanted to do a PDC with Jeff Lawton at the time because I watched his online PDC from like 15 years ago. And he just blew my mind. I loved watching him teach the PDC. And even though it was like a really old version. So when I found when I found out I had a chance to go to Jordan and do it with him, I just jumped on the opportunity right away. And mainly I wanted to do the desert permaculture because I I planned on moving to Arizona. I was living in Minnesota at the time, which is cold, temperate, freezing cold place. And I wanted to move to Arizona. So I thought, let's do the desert PDC and try to get some dry land skills. So did that last year, October of 2022. Went to Jordan for a 14-day PDC at the Greening the Desert site. And then a 14-day practical course with uh, Jeff and his team there on the site. So... I then after that, I got back to Phoenix because my wife, Omina and I, we moved to Phoenix right before that. And then we started looking for land. And I was always a huge fan of the place. It's a place called Sedona. I'm sure plenty of people have heard of it. We found a little piece of property just south of Sedona in a place called Cornville, Cornville, Arizona, just south of Sedona, two acres, tiny little house. I'm here now. And we ended up purchasing that house, and now we've got two acres to work with. We just we just moved in last March, so we're still new here, still working on the design. I was told to wait one year, live at a property for one year before you start making major changes. And I'm glad I did, because we're just in the middle of monsoon season here, so seeing I just experienced my first rain here since we moved in and I had never seen water on the property before. So I had no idea where the water flows, where it goes. And we just, we just witnessed that. So I took some great video of that and yeah, that's, that's uh, also I'll say I've done a couple design projects, a couple install projects through food forest abundance. And those have been great. The only thing I would say about those is because it's someone else's property, I just didn't get the kind of time that I wanted to spend at the property to really just observe every possible energy interaction. And we kind of, we observed that when we were work helping on projects, we said, we just need more time. We want, we, we don't maybe not need more time. We want more time to observe, to think, to talk, to brainstorm, And so we're like, we need our own place. We just, if we're really going to do this and practice techniques, we, Omina and I, we just said, we, we need our own place. Let's, uh, let's get this place. So wasn't really ready to buy a house. It wasn't, it wasn't in my plan, but this little property came up and we came inside. We're like, let's just do it. 
wrong time, perfect property. So we made it work and we're really happy we did. So here we are. That's great. I'm looking forward to hearing about all that. So we take it back to the very start. You, you said you first heard of permaculture in 2020, was it? Yeah, I heard the term long before that, but I didn't know. I, I just thought it was it meant living off grid kind of. Um, we have earth ships here in New Mexico. So I had known about those in Taos. I went to Taos to see the earth ship. So I know I knew it was something about sort of, you know, trying to be regenerative, trying trying to reuse uh, materials and not waste anything. But that's about all I knew about it. I didn't really know what it was until, well, first hearing Jim Gale on uh, Sam Tripoli's podcast and then taking that online PDC with Bill Mollison and Jeff Lawton. Then I knew what it was. I mean, I understood more what it was and yeah 2020 it, it all made sense during um the age of corona lockdowns because i i was at my computer all day anyways yeah i think a lot of us were yeah uh, a bit too much so then so you do that on uh the bill morrison's and and jeff's pdc yeah and then what do you, what do you do next at that stage then um You're just learning online <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I went down the rabbit hole on YouTube, watch as many videos as I could. And I was living in an apartment at the time, which we didn't have access to the yard. We we weren't allowed to do much in the yard. So I, I talked to a few friends about letting me experiment on their property. It just never really... Um, I was working a lot at the time too. So nothing really came of it. I was just, it was in my mind. I was interested. I knew I was obsessed. Let's say I would, after I first watched, uh, especially Jeff Lawton on that PDC online video from like 15, I think it was 2006 or something. That's when I knew, okay, this is, this is what I want to pursue. This is awesome. And uh, a couple months later, we just joined Food Forest Abundance because I thought that would be the best way to immerse myself and get a, a first client and and learn how to do it. So shortly after that, I got a email or a phone call from a lady named Lana, and she asked if I was available for an install in Minnesota, close to where I was living. So. Omina and I said yes. We met our first client, Jordan, and that was our first install experience. It was shortly after we joined the co-op. So, do you want to just explain when you say join FFA, yeah. join the co-op? Do you want to explain what that is? Yeah. So, FFA is Food Force Abundance. They are new. I think twenty twenty, and what Jim Gale created was he's got his own. Oh, his own whole story, which maybe, or maybe not, I'm sure you've probably heard before. He created a cooperative, which was, you were available to join as an installer. And then they had like a design team. So you could be a designer or an installer. That's how they broke up the operations. And basically they would uh, attract clients online. Clients will come then they'll do a consultation with the designer. They'll come up with a rough design. And then once they agree on the design, the Food Force Abundance will, will try to hook the client up with a local installer to actually start putting this thing into practice on the property. So Yeah, I, um, I was a designer for FFA. So I did the designs, but I, I never uh, I never got any installs. So I think that model for, because this is about business and entrepreneurship, uh, yeah. so, so that was a, a way you could uh, buy in and then get, get get some work from it. Yes. And then how, how did that process go then? So uh, Lana phones you up, uh, you get the install then, and, and, and how did that whole process go? Uh, well, my first thought, we just agreed. We said yes, because we were so hungry for our first install just to get started. Let's, And I assumed it wasn't going to be that hard. I was wrong. It was hard. 
there's a lot to learn. First of all, things on the design might not actually be at the nursery. So you've got to kind of, imp I mean, that might not sound like a big deal, but it, it turned into a process where I was just going to the nursery as much as I could and talking to the people that work there, showing them the design, asking them, okay, I've got, you know, this grape, will this grape work? Sure. Yeah. Um, couldn't find certain, some of the permaculture specific plants they didn't have at the nursery. So it led to a lot of phone calls, calling places, using the internet to try to find uh, smaller, obscure permaculture nurseries, which we ended up finding. There's a great one in Minnesota up north. And um, yeah. It, yeah, so you've, was, done, you've done many, many installs. Did you do them? Was it? We, we did that one. And I, th I would say that was a success. It was basically just there. His property had so much beautiful grass, like the grass was perfect. So our first obstacle was like how to deal with this grass. And I was talking to different people. Some people were saying, you know, use the cardboard method to kind of drown it out. Other people were saying, I get like a till and till it up and then just remove it by hand. So it was my first sort of uh, actually dealing with the what was happening on the ground, like step by step. Um, and it, it ended up being challenging and we got it done. I thought it went well. We just planted a bunch of trees and plants and stuff and then tried to figure out what the, where the water was coming from. But Minnesota is a lot different than the desert. You, you don't have this water issue like you have here and you don't have the strong sun like you do here. So it was uh, more just putting stuff in the ground and making sure we put, you know, dug the hole the right size, put in some amendments and the trees take off. Not that I, th I don't, I, th I don't think all the trees made it, but uh, I think that's okay too. Um, yeah. So that was my last Minnesota install that my wife, Omina and I did. We just did the one because we knew we were moving to Phoenix. So we didn't want to invest too much in our Minnesota operation. And I just for those that might not be familiar with the states, Minnesota is north on the border of Canada and Arizona is south on the border of Mexico. So totally different climates. Um, it's just a different game completely. I'm w much more similar to where I was in Jordan even though Jordan is 400 meters below sea level and we're like 3,000 feet, up, well, 1,000 meters above sea level here. So still different, but much more similar than Minnesota. Anyways, um, later that summer, we moved to Phoenix, which and basically just stopped all permaculture stuff because we had to we had to move out of our apartment, move into a friend's, plan our trip to Phoenix. We drove to Phoenix. And I was working the whole time for my, I'm a, I'm an appraiser. I'm a real estate appraiser here in uh, the U S. So at that point, when we were transitioning, permaculture just went into the back burner completely. I knew I was going to Jordan later in the fall. So I said, I'll pick it up. I'll go to Jordan, come back to Phoenix and try to hit the ground running uh, with installs. Once I get to Phoenix and then this, so that happened, we moved to Phoenix and I, um, who oh got, I, I forgot how it happened, but I got involved with Pat, Pat as a member of food force abundance. She, uh, I met her and Wayne up in Payson and they had a few installs. So I basically worked on some jobs that she got and just trying to apply what I just learned in Jordan. I tried to apply it see if I was of any help to her um, on these jobs in Phoenix, which happened. I, I didn't play. I wasn't the front runner and I was okay with that because I realized once I got to Phoenix, like just, just digging a hole in Phoenix is a lot different than in Minnesota. Cause it's just rock and clay. And, and so it was um, yeah, I knew there was going to be a learning curve for me. And that was another reason we just bought a place because we were like, I don't want to mess up. I don't want an expensive mistake. 
So let's practice some of these strategies on our own property before we like start trying to sell our service. And that's kind of where we're at now. I feel a lot better about doing, cause we already started doing stuff. And I'll say that in Jordan, I met a, some great people, some really great people. And they've got a lot of experience in permaculture and landscape architecture. One of my now, now friends, he's from Australia. His name's Grant, Grant Mondrell. And he's like a very experienced, he's got his master's degree in landscape architecture and he's been doing permaculture and uh, natural sequence farming for the past 10 or 20, I mean, 20 years architecture. And then he's shifted to permaculture over the past 10 years. So every question I have, he's got the answer for the most part within reason. He's pretty much done it all before. So our the past couple months have just been him and I chatting uh, about some jobs that have come in, nothing has happened. No, none of the installs that we've been working on have happened yet, but I'm confident that they will. I've got a few things in the back burner, but mostly just working on this two acre site here, making a plan figure. Cause it is brutal here. We planted a couple trees that my wife got for working at a nursery in Phoenix they gave her a few trees. So we're like, we don't have a design yet, but let's just plant these in the ground and see what happens. Well, five of them, we just planted in the ground and, and a couple of them, we ran some irrigation lines to, and then some that are closer to our front door, we're just irrigating by hand. And then one was we planted right next to this little prosopis tree. They call it mesquite here, but we planted it next to this little prosopis tree kind of dug out a gill dug out a basin connected it to the road hoping that when it rains that basin would fill up with rainwater and then this plum tree would get the benefit of that rainwater well we planted like seven trees they're all struggling uh they were doing great until the summer around july 4th once the what they call the dog days of summer hit you could tell the fig, the apple, the cherry died. We had a nectarine. We had a uh, apricot thriving until about July. Then you could tell they just couldn't handle the heat. The exception was this little plum we put in next to the mesquite, and we dug that basin, and we planted a bunch of trees, and that thing got full of rainwater the past couple rains we've got. And that thing is going crazy. The plum is thriving. It's growing. It's got a lot of new growth. So it was our first lesson, like how brutal the sun can be, how shade is going to be the priority, how how much we have to like capture the water because um, the land is just, it's dry. It is really dry. It hasn't, you know, it gets a couple inches a year. I think we get like 11 total, but um, yeah. Anyways, yeah, so it's little, a it's yeah. a big challenge. Uh, I've seen the uh, green in the desert site in Jordan. I've seen the videos of that, so it proves it can be done. It just takes a lot yeah. of work. So let's go back to the PDC, sort of like the holy grail of a permaculture person. They get to be taught by Jeff Lawton. Yes, do you want to, uh, I seen your photographs online when, when you're at the at the course? It looked back, it looked great. Do you want to tell us about that experience? Yeah, so it was my first time out of. I mean, I was like, I've been to Mexico and Canada but, and and the UK. I've been to the UK, but never the Middle East, really. So it was my first time flying into the Middle East, which was, I wasn't that nervous, I would say, because I had done so much research and like, I'm, I'm going to this PDC and, um, but it was, it was a lot. It was, it was definitely it was definitely an experience for me. Went to, flew into Amman, got an Airbnb. It was my first time in like an Arabic country with uh, the call to prayer in the morning. And I, you know, most, a lot of people speak English, but a lot of people don't. So I was a little bit out of my comfort zone. It became very normal by the end. I was there for a month. It felt great. I, I love Jordan. I can't wait to go back, but 
anyways, so yeah, we started in Amman. Our host was just amazing. He like brought me home cooked food, picked me up from the airport, uh, took me all around, met his friends. Like it was just awesome experience. But yeah, then we then he actually drove us an hour down into the Dead Sea Valley. And it was just surreal because like you're going to, down to the Dead Sea in this ancient historic land that I had only heard about growing up. Um, the baptism site of Jesus was just down the block. So it was it's a really cool place to go. And yeah, we um, we basically it was really hot at the time when we got there in October. And my friend Anthony and I, we rented a a house, a nice house. It had air conditioning and a pool. And it was just, we had the place to ourselves and it was just a block away from the greening, the desert site. So it was good. We went there and met our first day. We went in, I walk into the cafe and Jeff is just standing at the front door uh, with a room full of just his wife and the local women that are there. And I'm like, Oh, there he is. Shook his hand. Hey, I'm Dan. He's like, Hey, I'm Jeff. And it was just kind of like a, Whoa, a surreal experience because at that point I had watched everything I could about him. So he was, it was kind of like, Oh my God, it's, you know, Jeff Lawton. And yeah, then we went outside and started meeting people. It was kind of a big PDC. I think there was 40 people, 40 people in the class. And everyone was just like, you know, conjugating in the in the uh, courtyard area. And he basically gave us a little tour. He's like, all right, this, you know, this is the kitchen. This is the classroom. That's the that's the living quarters up there. If you need to use the bathroom, here's the here's the bathroom block. And then there's showers upstairs. And he's like, oh, are you staying here? We're like, no, we rented the house right next door. He's like, ah, good call. Because a lot of people were uh, sleeping in tents and it was so hot at the time. And um, yeah, anyway, so <laughs> it was kind of it was kind of funny because we were like, yeah, we got this. Taj Mahal up on the hill and uh it worked out I'm glad we made it because I wanted to camp but my friend Anthony said no I'm not camping no way let's get a Airbnb so I was like all right and anyway so then um the next day the class starts and it was just cool I mean we were in their natural building they built the the classroom uh with straw bale and concrete and I think you can watch that video somewhere online where they're building it but big classroom, standard classroom, big whiteboard, a bunch of little desks with the little folding chairs with the desk on it. So everyone's got their own little desk. And it was a group of just uh, the most diverse group ever. People from everywhere came to this class and I'm looking around and it's just like the most diverse group of people ever. And yeah, that was two weeks of that for 10 days straight, eight hours a day. We're just in the classroom with Jeff, Sam, Parker Davies, and then Estevan, who uh, his three teachers, the three teachers who taught the course, and they just ran through it all uh, chapter by chapter. We got the, it was really nice because you're right there. If you have a question, you just raise your hand. And you can ask immediate feedback from Jeff and the other teachers, lots of little insights they give you like, so eventually they broke us into groups for our final design exercise. And the final design exercise was designing a nearby mosque that was just up the road. So we all walked to the mosque, we met the imam, and it was about a two acre site at the base of a mountain. So the design exercise was like cap this this mountain right next to the mosque, right above the mosque, is a huge watershed. So when it does rain there, this this mosque is going to just get this huge influx of water, you know, uh, thousands of gallons. Um. So that was the first design exercise, and he showed us how to use the laser level to find the contour lines. Uh, he like emphasized the different kind of dams that we might want to use, uh, to capture this water and store it and then 
deliberate across the site, which was, yeah, it was cool. It was a design exercise. I had like five people in my group and, uh, yeah, we, we designed that mosque up and then the weekend we all went to Petra in between the two. So to split up the, it was a two week course halfway in the middle, about half of us went to Petra. I got sick as a dog. So did other people. It was, uh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't like go to the hospital. It was just run to the toilet every 30 minutes. And it was just so annoying. So that lasted for like four days. I still went to class. So did everyone else. I mean, I wasn't the worst. Everyone, I would say over half the people got sick. Uh, like, just like I did not, not like going to the hospital. It wasn't even that bad, like throwing up or anything. It was mostly just diarrhea. Everyone got diarrhea basically. And, um, yeah, that was after just a long, uh, a long bus ride to Petra, I think. And then we went to Wadi Rum. We spent the night in Wadi Rum Desert. The Bedouins made us, uh, they, they, I don't know what you call the technique, but they dig a hole in the ground and they cook like meat and vegetables in the ground and then they unbury it and then you go into the tent and then and then you eat and then after dinner so it's like a it's a fun party with the bedouins that was really cool in wadi rum which is like if you've seen the movie uh with matt damon is it mars or something it no dune the, the newer movie dune they shot at wadi rum just amazing place but yeah, we did Wadi Rum and then we did Petra it was awesome, but like it was just hard on our body. It was like oh, for over 40 degrees Celsius and we were just baking. Everyone was drenched in sweat and we got back to the bus and then we got back and like the next day everyone was sick. So it wasn't that bad, but it made me want to cut my trip short, which I ended up doing. Anyways, next after the two week PDC. We, uh, then we had the internship. We had the two week practical courses. They called it where we did chop and drop. We made 14 day compost in the chicken coop. We, uh, he taught, he taught us how to prune. He taught us, Oh, we helped him build his natural swimming pool. There was some classroom work. There was a little lesson on how to make mud brick and straw bale. But yeah, it was mostly just working in the actual food forest at greening the desert site, going through, looking at the different trees that are growing, what their function was, how we can use them. But yeah, most of it was a lot of chop and drop and a lot of compost making. So we were in that chicken coop with a big heap of, you know, we, so basically yeah, basically what we did is went through the food forest, collected all the, the dry leaves, collected any sort of organic material we can, brought it over to the chicken coop, cut a bunch of leukina, which was growing, and we were just chopping it, bringing it over to the chicken coop, and then scooping the chicken manure. They had collected the manure, so we made this big, huge pile of chicken manure compost, and then every day we flipped it we or every well, it was like every first one it's like every the first three days you wait three days and then every other day you turn the compost so there'd be like four of us in there i was the guy that had my pitchfork i went in and i got i scooped out the dead chicken that had been put in there like six days earlier and it was the worst smell ever like this. It was not only was it chicken manure, there was a dead chicken in there. And uh, you can watch video. Everyone's just like doing this, uh, <laughs> trying to make this compost. So it was a good lesson. The, the problem was they, they were doing all these renovations at the Greening the Desert site. So where the chicken coop was, I don't think was the permanent place. It was like this temporary place which there's no wind. It was just like kind of, um, it ended up being kind of a, you know, like a very uh, just kind of warm. There's a lot of flies and really strong smells. Um, but I think normally they would do it. They would have, if you've seen Jeff Lawton's chicken tractor, the way he does it is there's the chicken 
there's the chicken coop and then they they'll make a pile and then it slowly they turn it onto the next pile so you need like this big long area where you can keep flipping it and this wasn't that it was just a little small and incl temporary enclosure where anyways it was a good lesson i'm glad i did it I, i'm gonna do it here as soon as soon as we can figure out where the chicken coop's going i'm gonna set up the whole same operation here uh, well that's that's what i was going to ask you next so what yeah. what have you brought back from the pc to your own property now because a great, a great four weeks education which mm -hmm. i think it would be uh i i would love to do that myself not maybe not the the desert climate uh yeah i'm, I'm more a temp temperate climate here but all right so what did you bring back from the pdc for your own property i would say uh well i didn't know at first i didn't know what i was going to be able to use at first i just soaked it all in and like i was saying once i realized um how harsh the sun is here in arizona and how dry it is I real now I realize like we have to do the same thing that they did there here. And that means starting with 95% pioneer species, focus on collecting every drop of water that we can and try to rehydrate the land and do all of that before we think we're going to have a thriving food forest. And that was just the realization that came to me not that long ago after like in one summer hit, because before summer hit, I'm like, ah, oh, you can stick an apple in the ground. It's going to grow. You can see whatever. Everything was thriving. We had irrigation and then summer hit and it all like half of it died. It just couldn't handle the sun. So the main thing I took back is the, the step-by-step -step process. It's going to be water access structures and it, we have to focus on water here. And what I, like I said, we had our first rain and I have video. I, I sat outside during this heavy rain and I videoed every water, every water channel moving across the land. And like, that's where we're going to cut in and capture it there. We've got a hill there. We're going to, so we've got, we were able to like develop our plan. Now the next step is just busting out the laser level, finding those contour points and we're a little bit limited because we have we we know what we know that we want to have structures here on the land like uh we're going to do a sauna we're going to have a trailer for guests we're going to have like a meditation tent you know for lack of a better word a meditation tent uh maybe do some like earth bag dome style stuff uh, we're unsure we know we want to do that stuff so we're kind of limited where we can put swales. We don't want to put swales through the middle of a place where we're going to put a chicken coop. Right. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the next step is busting out the laser level. I bought a device. I want to show it to you. Cause I, I think it is really cool. And I would suggest if, if people that watch this end up needing to calculate square meters or square footage this is a really good tool and it was able to help me find basically the the overall direction the slopes of the land it's not the best for identi identifying contour points uh but it gives you like it's a good first step to use this thing and maybe you've seen it i have it right back here i'll just grab it real quick so this thing i got an either a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad, but it's called Mosher. And it's just, it's just this little, um, this like little puck, right? And it, it detects motion. And then you download an app on your phone and then it connects to the app and then it comes with this little stick. So you go out and you can hold it like this, right? And then you, you just, you put your phone in it like that, this, and basically you just um you walk around with this thing and then touch it to the ground and it's taking measurement readings so at the end you can measure any sort of obscure shape out in your yard and it will give you the total square footage so you can make these cool closed shapes so like if you have like a really non symmetrical area where you're going to turn into a food forest and you're like oh i don't know how much mulch i should buy i don't 
because it's a weird area. It's hard to calculate. This thing is awesome because it just it's going to give you those uh it's going to give you that sketch on your phone and you can export it as a PDF or even a CAD file. It does everything in 3D. So I could I could take a bunch of measurements on my LAN and it's measuring the elevation too. So I can go in and I can look at where where's the hill? Where how how big of a difference is it? What's what's the rise over run? And this thing does all of that which I love. I think it was a great first step, but now that I kind of know where the water moves and we've seen it rain, we know where it, where it pools up. Now the next thing will be like I do I did I was trying to get out of buying the laser level because I just didn't want to spend the money on the nice laser level, but I think we're going to get the laser level and the next the next thing will be to just find those contour points and then we're just going to dig in and still trying to figure out what's the best tool to use to like actually do this. Cause that was the, that was the big thing why I went to get my PDC. This is the point I wanted to make. Um, During my first influx of permaculture information, it was all theoretical and it was, I didn't know, like it all made sense theoretically, but as soon as I got on the ground at that first job, it's like, they didn't talk about these things that actually there's a rock. There's a giant rock where the, where the garden's supposed to be. So I have to deal with that. That's a real world, actual scenario that is not theoretical. And that's just an example. But the point is like, um, get, I wanted to merge. I wanted my, to, I wanted to learn how to design based on, what was actually on the ground so that like, if I did make a design, I could hand it over to someone and they could read the design and it would reflect reality of what's actually happening on the ground. So that's why I brought up my friend, Grant Mondrell mentor, Grant Mondrell. And he was the guy that as soon as I got home from Jordan, he's, I told him like, I don't want to just make a concept plan. That's cool. It's, it's, it looks good on paper. I love the designs like, you know, fruit trees and berry bushes and the compost goes over there, but you got to actually know how to build it once it comes time to actually build it. So he's like, you need to learn how to survey. So I'm going to teach you how to survey. So he, he showed me how to measure land. He showed me how to use triangulation to figure out where things that were already on the land, how to put them to scale on a drawing. So when you make your, um, when you actually make your design, you can start with a survey and an, a contour map before you, you know, actually plan breaking ground and stuff. So hope that makes sense what I said, but, uh, yeah, it was basically just like make the contour, make the survey, make the water plan, make the structure, the, the structure plan, um, Oh yeah. The other thing was like irrigation. We here, if you're going to have a, I get it. If you have a small garden, you can, you can water it by hand, but like I have two acres here and we want to plant stuff, different places. The summer's long. There's no way I'm going to be able to every morning before work, go out and drag the hose to all the spots and measure or water everything. It just won't happen. We tried and stuff died because we just we didn't have time to water that day so i had to learn irrigation and that's where there's a there's a a guy uh his name's clint gulbertson he runs a company here in or down in phoenix called uh galaxy gardens you can look them up galaxy garden they they uh they specialize in like the brad lancaster style basins they capture roof water they're landscaper. They're landscapers that was do they were doing traditional landscaping. He found Brad Lancaster's work. And then he watched the Jeff Lawton Greening the Desert site videos. And he just got obsessed with it. So they changed their landscaping company to like a permaculture landscaping company. And as soon as I got back from Jordan, I knew they existed because I had followed them on YouTube. 
I hit him up. I just called him. I found his number, called him, told him I just got back from Jordan and if he wanted help. So I went to a couple jobs with him and he gave me a crash course on irrigation. That was what he's done for the past like 20 years. I think he's done irrigation and he just gave me the ins and outs. So I was able at least to know the parts and kind of know how to hook it up partially and so we started irrigating here. That was like the big learning. That's how I spent a lot of time uh, messing around at Home Depot in the hardware store, like figuring out these different connector pieces and how to how to just ba- trench it properly and use the different, you know, you can use T's and crosses and s- big half inch line, quarter inch line, different sprinkler heads. Oh, there's pressure compensated and non-pressure compensated. So I got the crash course in all of this. Oh yeah. One more thing I'll give people can look up. I've been, um, check out if you're interested in irrigation and you're interested in, in like off grid or permaculture, passive irrigation. There's a guy in Australia and Jeff Lawton taught me this on the last day that I was in Jordan. He got so excited about it and it's called measured irrigation and you can go to measured irrigation.com and check it out. It was, it's a guy, his name's Dr. Bernie Omade, and he, he just created a, uh, a little device. I have it here. If you come to my YouTube or if you come to my Instagram, it's just ddon.life, D-D-O-N period L-I-F-E, ddon.life. And then we have our new Instagram, which is House Mountain Ranch. And you, you basically, the way it works, it's so much easier to show, to show, but it's passive irrigation. And so he just took a little terracotta pot, similar to like what you have behind you, Cormac, um, on your plants in the background. If, yeah, and basically what it is, it's a, a pot, and in the middle of the pot is a, is a dowel rod with a float on it. So that thing fills up with water, and when when it's full of water, the the float is floating in the water, right? So if it's full of water, the thing's floating in the water. Well, terracotta pots are porous, so eventually the water seeps out like people have heard of oya pots oyas uh the water the water will seep out and then it'll it'll evaporate well when it evaporates the float goes lower and lower and lower and lower eventually there's a magnet on the bottom of the float and then eventually that magnet will hit the bottom and then underneath the pot is a a valve so when the magnet hits the valve it opens the valve and the irrigation event begins. So the point is, is that you hook, you replace instead of a timer. And a lot of people use a timer for irrigation. You replace that and you put this terracotta pot and it also has, so (laughs) it's okay. So you, uh, you have this terracotta pot, it's full of water. It evaporates. And when it, empties out and evaporates boom the irrigation event starts and water gets delivered water starts going out well meanwhile there's a an emitter dripping back into the terracotta pot so eventually that terracotta pot is going to fill up with water again just during the irrigation event so it goes out at the same rate it goes out to all your drip lines so basically it's a smart irrigation system that is pretty much hands off when it rains the terracotta pot fills up and there's no need for irrigation because it just rained on your garden you don't need to water your garden after it rained well it also rained inside the terracotta pot so the magnet detached and it's floating as soon as that mag as soon as that water evaporates the irrigation valve will open and then it'll start sending water out and meanwhile, it's dripping water back into the pot. So eventually that that's how the irrigation event will end once the pot fills back up with water. If that makes sense, it's kind of a yeah, it all part. makes sense. Uh, yeah. All right. So it's like an automated system, which is really handy in a dry climate. It saves water, saves time. And it responds. It it's it if it's extra hot, it evaporates faster. 
if it's cool, like it was yesterday, the water just sits in the pot and it doesn't evaporate. So, uh, and if, yeah, it's dry, if it's dry outside of the pot, it'll evaporate more. If it's wet outside the pot, it doesn't evaporate. So I know that's a great system. I, I had heard of Mosier before as well. I've mm-hmm. seen I've seen the ads on on, on the TV. So, uh, so what what you uh, you called it? Uh, Mountain House Ranch was it? House Mountain Ranch. House Mountain Ranch, and yep. so that's so that's the two acre site you are building now for yourselves, and that, as that's yep. like a showcase of everything you're learning. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, so uh, your design services? Do you offer design services? Or yeah. Consultation. For sure. For sure. And now more than ever, I've got a team of people together. So it's not just me. Like I mentioned, Grant. And then I have a few friends that I've definitely been leaning on from the PDC. Um, yes. If you want to give me a call, if you're in, I like, I, I'm interested in working in the desert. So if you're in Arizona or one of the nearby states that are considered dry lands, that's, if you want to give us a call, we'll get on it. Um, but yeah, sticking to the desert, mostly Arizona, if possible, I like, my focus is this area, this little area around me, just trying to master as much as I can this specific little area in the plants that grow here. But uh, yeah. and how's your, how's your uh, what what digital tools do you use for design? Do you, do you hand draw your designs or do you render them on on a computer? Yeah, the different. I be, we've been playing with different techniques. If if it's that uh, if we're gonna do a survey, it's all hand drawn and that consists of sloppy notes out in the field. And then we get back to our desk and uh, make a a nice copy with different compasses and rulers to scale. Yeah. What software are you using? um, Well, if, if, if I'm just, I've been using Canva for digital stuff, like to make a base map of a property, just hop on Canva, Google Earth, make different layers that way. If I'm working with Grant, he puts it into CAD. Wait, and... I never, I never, Canva's the first for me. But uh, we use Canva. I, I love Canva. It's great. It's uh, great. Uh, no, I, I would love to see a, a design being done on Canva. i make a good YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, so I, let me uh, announce that. Soon yeah. I will, I'm actually today, uh, we're going to be shooting just like this, a podcast. If you go to YouTube, we started a YouTube channel called House Mountain Ranch, and it's going to be a design channel that starts here at our property in Cornville. And I uploaded a tour of the property so you can just see the two acres. And uh, I'm shooting today with Grant. We're just going to do a design session focusing on water. It's going to be a design channel focusing on the play-by-plays here at House Mountain Ranch. And then once that gets established, we'll probably just branch out. If we do other projects, we'll we'll showcase it on House Mountain Ranch. So that's you can find us on Instagram at House Mountain Ranch. I just started a YouTube channel called House Mountain Ranch. Uh, we'll and leave then, it, we'll leave them links, all the links in the description. Perfect. I'll I'll definitely be subscribing because that sounds really interesting. Uh, thank even you. though it's not a not applicable in my climate, but it, like everything, it's the techniques, the approach. That, I find that really interesting. That kind of stuff. How how does somebody else see a piece of land? Yeah, and uh, and as designers as well, it can only it can only benefit designers. They watch that kind of thing. They see they see under the uh, the eyes of somebody else. So uh, so uh, anything else in the future? Uh, part of the YouTube channel. Anything else uh, on the horizons? That's that's pretty much it on uh, our end. Not, we uh, we want to build a earth a straw bell house here, so maybe that'll all be on House Mountain Ranch. Oh, that's, yeah. that's great stuff. Um, Daniel, it's been really great chatting to you, and I'm looking forward to going and seeing all that content. And for anybody who wants the links, will be down in the description for that. Um, and that's us. And uh, as well, if you check down the links as well, our PDC professional course. Is launching soon, so taking you from uh post PDC when you come out, if you don't know what to do or you want to start up your own design uh firm, so it's looking at things like customer communications, which you probably know learned a lot about, Daniel, and that ba- balancing the install with the oh, you design. Broke up and, there for a sec. Yeah. Um, so it's like I hey, have a PDC professional course coming out, the links in the description. 
So it's basically taking you from awesome. post PDC to a learning digital design, learning client communications, things, Daniel, you mentioned there, uh, how do you work with your installer as well? And I, I always found that getting a good installer was always better. And you had, if you had that trust with them, you were able to say, sort of give them the sort of, I know some designers didn't like installers making changes, but I always felt if you work together and, and your installer knew what they were talking about, it made a huge difference. And that communication really was the key. For, uh, getting, a good, getting a good site survey done, relaying that back to your design team. And that, that's all important. So we cover all aspects of that as well. And, awesome. and then starting your own business then from websites, social media marketing, we touched on that a little as well. Uh, that was our uh, sales pitch anyway. So if you check that out in the description, you can have a... Uh, a link that you can sign up. It's coming out next month. Daniel, thanks again. And uh absolutely. Was great Thank you. Cheers. And I, I know it was about me. I, I wanna this was the first time we've chatted, Cormac. So hopefully we can chat again. And I, I'd love to hear your story. So thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh yep. And I, if, if you got value of that, like, subscribe and thumbs up. <laughs> I always forget that, but <laughs>